What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, taste, and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. Hey there, sim lifers. How's it going? Thanks for stopping by and glad you're interested in learning more about simulators and how the time we spend on playing them can affect our skills in the real world. All too often we're told by our parents or people in society that video games are just a waste of time. It's actually this very psychology that makes one more likely to end up with a gaming addiction, not the games themselves. Never say something like, stop playing and go do something real, or stop wasting your time and do something that matters. Because when you say things like that, you're sending them down the other path, the dark path that we don't want. That was a game designer and researcher. We'll hear more from her in a few minutes to elaborate, but we usually think of things like racing wheels, joysticks, and the software that utilizes them as merely games. But given how the brain works, anything we spend time doing, we get better at it. So what happens when a game so closely replicates real life? Can it actually translate into real world skills? Are simulators or games really that much of a waste of time? Well, consider how many professions already find them to be a completely legitimate training system for their employees. Take for example, doctors who simulate super complicated surgeries for practice. They may even have to use the same robotic type controllers to perform the actual operations. Now, would that be considered gaming? Yikes! Now that's very serious gaming if so. Laparoscopic surgeons, those who specialize in using small instruments and tiny incisions, can benefit from simulators that use comparable controllers. But story-based mainstream games have also been shown to improve doctor's spatial perception and hand-eye coordination. I mean, interesting, right? Even a doctor's downtime could be used to improve their skills by playing Final Fantasy or something similar. In order to teach a better understanding of all elements of its plans in a call center for responders, one major health insurance carrier combined an app-style game of slicing sushi with pop trivia on the company's health coverage. The game's manufacturer performed a study that showed 66% reduction in mistakes after training which kind of shows how important getting invested in a game can be. Employees were retaining the information that came laced within the game. Is PC Simulator just a game? Oh, but what if I told you that many electronic and appliance repair people also use these so-called simulator-type games for paid training? Some even go so far as to make the experience quite immersive with VR. Just like with any racing sim, a virtual environment is a more forgiving one in which to find out what mistakes can be made. There must be a big profit margins lost on giving people too big of an ice cream scoop as one sweet treat franchise created a video game simulation that instructs employees on exactly how much to put in every scoop. Well, how about the virtual life of a trucker who's in the process of getting a commercial license? American Truck Simulator might be considered a viable trainer, even if it doesn't feel much like a job. And that's what we're playing right now. Taking a load from San Francisco to Washington. The challenge is in making it like a real truck would have to. No dents, no scratches, no tickets. Which often means careful and slow around the corners while watching your mirrors to compensate for the long trailers behind these cabs. Even if you're not planning on being a truck driver someday, pretty sure this game would still aid in one's driving skills and being attentive and diligent at vehicle handling. I'll get to a full review of this on the channel shortly. Seriously, this is pretty fun even though I didn't expect that it would be. The game's attention to detail is a really neat aspect with the maps that have quite accurate recreations of actual real-life places. When driving through the areas of the country I used to live in, the signs are all correct and the emergency vehicles in every region have been adjusted to match. Highways were scaled down to a 20th of the scale and it allows for seeing the landscape in time-lapse driving. We'll transition to some faster machines, but for now, riding in a big 18-wheeler is an easy setting to chat about that first thing I mentioned, the psychology tied to games and whether or not they can be a beneficial addition to life or a massive mind enslaver through addiction. What does Jane McGonagall have to say? 
She's a researcher who teaches at Stanford University and beyond. This clip is a portion of her second TED Talk that might give a little more thought about what really is a waste of time. It's about to go deep here, and we're about to get seven and a half minutes of life added to our clock, so let's listen in. Jane, games are great and all, but on your deathbed, are you really gonna wish you spent more time playing Angry Birds? This idea is so pervasive that games are a waste of time that we will come to regret that I hear it literally everywhere I go. For example, true story, just a few weeks ago, this cab driver, upon finding out that a friend and I were in town for a game developers conference, turned around and said, and I quote, I hate games, waste of life. Imagine getting to the end of your life and regretting all that time. Now, I want to take this problem seriously. I mean, I want games to be a force for good in the world. I don't want gamers to regret the time they spent playing, time that I encourage them to spend. So I have been thinking about this question a lot lately. When we're on our deathbeds, will we regret the time we spent playing games? Now, this may surprise you, but it turns out there is actually some scientific research on this question. It's true. Hospice workers, the people who take care of us at the end of our lives, recently issued a report on the most frequently expressed regrets that people say when they are literally on their deathbeds. And that's what I want to share with you today. The top five regrets of the dying. Number one, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Number two, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. Number three, I wish I had let myself be happier. Number four, I wish I'd had the courage to express my true self. And number five, I wish I'd lived a life true to my dreams instead of what others expected of me. Now, as far as I know, no one ever told one of the hospice workers, I wish I'd spent more time playing video games. But when I hear these top five regrets of the dying, I can't help but hear five deep human cravings that games actually help us fulfill. For example, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. For many people, this means I wish I'd spent more time with my family, with my kids when they were growing up. Well, we know that playing games together has tremendous family benefits. A recent study from Brigham Young University's School of Family Life reported that parents who spend more time playing video games with their kids have much stronger real-life relationships with them. I wish I'd stay in touch with my friends. Well, hundreds of millions of people use social games like Farmville or Words with Friends to stay in daily contact with real-life friends and family. A recent study from Michigan University showed that these games are incredibly powerful relationship management tools. They help us stay connected with people in our social network that we would otherwise grow distant from if we weren't playing games together. I wish I'd let myself be happier. Well, here I can't help but think of the groundbreaking clinical trials recently conducted at East Carolina University that showed that online games can outperform pharmaceuticals for treating clinical anxiety and depression. Just 30 minutes of online gameplay a day was enough to create dramatic boosts in mood and long-term increases in happiness. I wish I'd had the courage to express my true self. Well, avatars are a way to express our true selves, our most heroic, idealized version of who we might become. You can see that in this alter ego portrait by Robbie Cooper of a gamer with his avatar. And Stanford University has been doing research for five years now to document how playing a game with an idealized avatar changes how we think and act in real life making us more courageous, more ambitious, more committed to our goals. I wish I'd led a life true to my dreams and not what others expected of me. Are games doing this yet? I'm not sure, so I've left a question mark, a Super Mario question mark. We're gonna come back to this one. But in the meantime, perhaps you're wondering, who is this game designer to be talking to us about deathbed regrets? And it's true, I've never worked in a hospice, I've never been on my deathbed, but recently I did spend three months in bed wanting to die. Really wanting to die. Well, let me tell you that story. 
It started two years ago when I hit my head and got a concussion. Now the concussion didn't heal properly and after 30 days, I was left with symptoms like nonstop headaches, nausea, vertigo, memory loss, mental fog. My doctor told me that in order to heal my brain, I had to rest it. So I had to avoid everything that triggered my symptoms. For me, that meant no reading, no writing, no video games, no work or email, no running, no alcohol, no caffeine. In other words, and I think you see where this is going, no reason to live. <laughs> Of course, it's meant to be funny, but in all seriousness, suicidal ideation is quite common with traumatic brain injuries. It happens to one in three, and it happened to me. My brain started telling me, Jane, you want to die. It said, you're never gonna get better. It said, the pain will never end. And these voices became so persistent and so persuasive that I started to legitimately fear for my life. Which is the time that I said to myself, after 34 days, and I will never forget this moment, I said, I am either gonna kill myself or I'm gonna turn this into a game. Now, why a game? Well, I knew from researching the psychology of games for more than a decade that when we play a game, and this is in the scientific literature, we tackle tough challenges with more creativity, more determination, more optimism, and we're more likely to reach out to others for help. And I wanted to bring these gamer traits to my real life challenge. So I created a role-playing recovery game called Jane the Concussion Slayer. Now, this became my new secret identity. And the first thing I did as a slayer was call my twin sister, I have an identical twin sister named Kelly, and tell her, I'm playing a game to heal my brain, and I want you to play with me. This was an easier way to ask for help. She became my first ally in the game. My husband, Kiyash, joined next. And together, we identified and battled the bad guys. Now, this was anything that could trigger my symptoms and therefore slow down the healing process, things like bright lights and crowded spaces. We also collected and activated power-ups. This was anything I could do on even my worst day to feel just a little bit good, just a little bit productive. Things like cuddling my dog for 10 minutes or getting out of bed and walking around the block just once. Now the game was that simple. Adopt a secret identity, recruit your allies, battle the bad guys, activate the power-ups. But even with a game so simple, within just a couple days of starting to play, that fog of depression and anxiety went away. It just vanished. It, it felt like a miracle. Now, it wasn't a miracle cure for the headaches or the cognitive symptoms. That lasted for more than a year, and it was the hardest year of my life by far. But even when I still had the symptoms, even while I was still in pain, I stopped suffering. Now what happened next with the game surprised me. I put up some blog posts and videos online explaining how to play, but not everybody has a concussion, obviously. Not everyone wants to be the slayer. So I renamed the game Super Better. And soon I started hearing from people all over the world who were adopting their own secret identity, recruiting their own allies, and they were getting super better, facing challenges like cancer and chronic pain, depression and Crohn's disease, even people were playing it for terminal diagnoses, like ALS. And I could tell from their messages and their videos that the game was helping them in the same ways that it helped me. They talked about feeling stronger and braver. They talked about feeling better understood by their friends and family. And they even talked about feeling happier, even though they were in pain, even though they were tackling the toughest challenge of their lives. Now, at the time, I'm thinking to myself, what is going on here? I mean, how could a game so trivial intervene so powerfully in such serious and in some cases, life and death circumstances? I mean, if it hadn't worked for me, there's no way I would have believed it was possible. Well, it turns out there's some science here too. Some people get stronger and happier after a traumatic event. And that's what was happening to us. The game was helping us experience what scientists call post-traumatic growth, which is not something we usually hear about. We usually hear about post-traumatic stress disorder, but scientists now know that a traumatic event doesn't doom us to suffer indefinitely. Instead, we can use it as a springboard to unleash our best qualities and lead happier lives. Here are the top five things that people with post-traumatic growth say. My priorities have changed. I'm not afraid to do what makes me happy. I feel closer to my friends and family. 
I understand myself better. I know who I really am now. I have a new sense of meaning and purpose in my life. I'm better able to focus on my goals and dreams. Now, does this sound familiar? It should, because the top five traits of post-traumatic growth are essentially the direct opposite of the top five regrets of the dying. Now, this is interesting, right? It seems that somehow a traumatic event can unlock our ability to lead a life with fewer regrets. But how does it work? How do you get from trauma to growth? Or better yet, is there a way to get all the benefits of post-traumatic growth without the trauma, without having to hit your head in the first place? That would be good, right? I, uh, I wanted to understand the phenomenon better, so I devoured the scientific literature, and here's what I learned. There are four kinds of strength or resilience that contribute to post-traumatic growth. And there are scientifically validated activities that you can do every day to build up these four kinds of resilience, and you don't need a trauma to do it. Now, I could tell you what these four types of strength are, but I'd rather you experience them firsthand. I'd rather we all start building them up together right now. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to play a quick game together. This is where you earn those seven and a half minutes of bonus life that I promised you earlier. All you have to do is successfully complete the first four Super Better quests. And I feel like you can do it. I have, I have confidence in you. So, everybody ready? This is your first quest. Here we go. Pick one. Stand up and take three steps, or make your hands into fists, raise them over your head as high as you can for five seconds. Go. All right, I like the people doing both. You are overachievers. Very good. <laughs> Well done, everyone. Now, that is worth plus one physical resilience, which means that your body can withstand more stress and heal itself faster. Now, we know from the research that the number one thing you can do to boost your physical resilience is to not sit still. That's all it takes. Every single second that you are not sitting still, you are actively improving the health of your heart, your lungs, and brains. Everybody ready for your next quest? I want you to snap your fingers exactly 50 times or count backwards from 100 by 7, like this, 193. Go. <laughs> nice. Wow. That's the first time I've ever seen that. Bonus physical resilience. Well done, everyone. Now, that's worth plus one mental resilience, which means you have more mental focus, more discipline, determination, and willpower. We know from the scientific research that willpower actually works like a muscle. It gets stronger the more you exercise it. So tackling a tiny challenge without giving up, even one as absurd as snapping your fingers exactly 50 times or counting backwards from 100 by 7, is actually a scientifically validated way to boost your willpower. So good job. Quest number three, pick one. Now, because of the room we're in, fate's really determined determine this for you, but here are the two options. If you're inside, find a window and look out of it. If you're outside, find a window and look in. Or do a quick YouTube or Google image search for baby your favorite animal. Now, you could do this on your phones, or you can just shout out some baby animals. I'm going to find some and put them on the screen for us. So what do we want to see? Sloth, giraffe, elephant, snake. Okay. All right, now what we're just feeling there is plus one, emotional resilience, which means you have the ability to provoke powerful positive emotions like curiosity or love, which we feel when we look at baby animals, when you need them most. And here's a secret from the scientific literature for you. If you can manage to experience three positive emotions for every one negative emotion over the course of an hour, a day, a week, you dramatically improve your health and your ability to successfully tackle any problem you're facing. Now, this is called the three to one positive emotion ratio. It's my favorite super better trick, so keep it up. All right, pick one, last quest. Shake someone's hand for six seconds or send someone a quick thank you by text, email, Facebook, or Twitter, go. Everybody, that is plus one social resilience, which means you actually get more strength from your friends, your neighbors, your family, your community. Now, a great way to boost social resilience is gratitude. Touch is even better. Here's one more secret for you. Shaking someone's hand for six seconds dramatically raises the level of oxytocin in your bloodstream. Now, that's the trust hormone. That means that all of you who just shook hands are biochemically primed to like and want to help each other. This will linger during the break, so take advantage of the networking opportunities. Okay, well, you have successfully completed your four quests, so let's see if I successfully completed my mission to give you seven and a half minutes of bonus life. And here's where I get to share one more little bit of science with you. It turns out that people who regularly boost these four types of resilience 
physical, mental, emotional, and social, live 10 years longer than everyone else. So this is true. If you are regularly achieving the three to one positive emotion ratio, if you are never sitting still for more than an hour at a time, if you are reaching out to one person you care about every single day, if you are tackling tiny goals to boost your willpower, you will live 10 years longer than everyone else. And here's where that math I showed you earlier comes in. So the average life expectancy in the US and the UK is 78.1 years. But we know from more than a thousand peer-reviewed scientific studies that you can add 10 years of life to that by boosting your four types of resilience. So every single year that you are boosting your four types of resilience, you're actually earning 0.128 more years of life or 46 more days of life or 67,298 more minutes of life, which means every single day you are earning 184 minutes of life or every single hour that you are boosting your four types of resilience like we just did together, you are earning 7.682458378 more minutes of life. Congratulations. Congratulations, those seven and a half minutes are all yours. You totally earned them. <laughs> all right, y'all. We're up seven and a half minutes, and we now even have more time to play games for more minutes. And I'm filled with the authenticity of being a race car driver because racing is one of my favorite things to do. So, we're hopping into something a whole lot faster than the truck. Race cars require even more focus the faster you go. So let's step it up a notch and get into some nuts and bolts. In order to understand how simulations can accelerate learning, let's just go a bit deeper into theory before entering fully into the simulation subject and let's see how the brain actually learns. The University of California Irvine Center for Neurobiology of Learning and Memory proved that during an experiment in the brain, neurons bond in order to transmit data more easily and accurately. These bonds strengthen as they're frequently used, which means that the more they're used, the quicker the information goes and the quicker the task is done. On the contrary, when the two neurons rarely interact with one another, the transmission of information weakens and the information takes more time to be transmitted. When the brain learns something new, the neurons have to create new connections, which implies that the person needs greater effort and attention to learn and do this new task. It's a bit like driving. If you already know the road, you'll drive to the destination without even thinking about it, like going to the office in the morning, or going back home after work, etc. But when you're going to a new place, you are more cautious about what's around you. You study the itinerary, you look for road signs, and in the end it will take more time in the route that you knew perfectly well. Simulations work the same way. They're known to help speed up cognitive processes, which are the mental processes that enable people to stock and use information and knowledge, but they also speed up the practical learning skills and behaviors. So back to this idea. Well, let's refer to the mirror neuron study. The mirror neurons were discovered in 1992 by neurophysiologists at the University of Parma. They found that these particular cells activate when you perform actions, but also when you see actions done in order to remember and replicate. The Brainy Business Podcast has a story for us on this one. Once upon a time, on a particularly hot day, there was a monkey in a lab at the University of Parma in Italy. It had some electrodes in its brain to test motor control and what areas in the brain would light up when the monkey would grab a cup or a peanut and then drink water or eat the peanut. This would allow the scientists to understand how the brain lights up for various motor control actions and if it was different when a monkey grabbed a cup versus a block versus a peanut and things like that. On this fateful day, one of the researchers reportedly came in eating an ice cream cone. The monkey did not move, and from the outside, all that someone might have noticed would be its eyes getting a little bigger with interest. But the brain told a different story. The monkey's brain lit up as if it were eating ice cream itself. Further studies found that when a person grabbed a peanut to hand it to the monkey, its brain would light up as if it were grasping the peanut itself. And if a researcher put a peanut in their mouth, the monkey's brain would light up as if it was putting a peanut in its mouth as well. Even when no visible movement occurs, the brain experiences tasks along with others as if it were experiencing these same things itself. This allowed the team to accidentally discover mirror neurons, which were first published in 1994. 
We know monkeys have mirror neurons, but what about humans? The short answer is yes. We humans have mirror neurons as well, and they greatly impact our lives every day. Mirror neurons have done some amazing things for all of humanity, first of which is our ability to learn by observation, and second is our ability to empathize. Let me tell you a little more about each one. We humans tend to take for granted how quickly and easily we learn things simply by watching others. That's not something every species can do. One way we're able to do this is through our mirror neurons. For example, a child watching an adult open a jar can learn how to open a jar when presented with one. A ballerina being taught the proper way to turn out their toes or lift their arm can do so by watching someone else, either in front of them or on a video. An aspiring public speaker can watch others give presentations and get tips for what to do and not to do themselves. All this can be done without talking to anyone or physically performing the acts, which is really astonishing when you think about it. And without mirror neurons, life as we know it would not exist. The first human to discover fire presumably did so by accident. I highly doubt that they had a process of trial and error working toward achieving this goal of heat and fire. So how did all the other humans learn quickly to replicate and do the same thing themselves? That's right, mirror neurons. This is also how the species learn to hunt, gather, farm, build homes, and all the skills we use every day. The collective intelligence of the species grows very quickly as one person learns to do something because others can watch and have their brain behave as if it has already done it once before. These learnings spread like wildfire. Pun very much intended. Let's revisit how the mirror neurons work. We each have approximately 100 billion neurons in our brains, and each of those has 1 to 10,000 contacts with other neurons forming associations. These are the associations I'm talking about when I give the example of saying the word apple and it being connected to all sorts of concepts, colors, flavors, smells, computers, phones, music... I'm guessing this is one that has developed closer to 10,000 associations. You may have heard this before, but it's said that these combinations and permutations of brain activity in a single brain exceed the number of elementary particles in the entire universe. Crazy complex and interesting to be sure. Mirror neurons are actually found in one spot in the brain, in the frontal lobes. The front of the brain is also home to our ordinary motor control neurons, which is why they discovered this while testing motor control functionality for that monkey. These neurons fire when a person performs a specific action. So when I grab a cup or a phone, kick a ball, things like that. Taking this a step further, you might ask a question about intention. Does that matter or make a difference? For example, if you're reaching to pick up a teacup and take a sip versus clearing a table, does it make a difference for mirror neurons? Studies have shown that it does. Participants were shown a hand picking up a teacup in three different scenarios. One, where there was a plate of cookies and a pot of tea nearby to simulate you're picking up the cup to take a sip. Another was placed amidst crumbs and a messy table to simulate cleaning up. And a final video with no context, simply picking up a teacup against a blank background. Their study found that the mirror neurons were more active when the context was included, meaning both intentions and actions matter and relate to mirror neurons. And mirror neurons will not respond to random, meaningless gestures. It's been found they are specially connected to respond to actions with clear goals. And this is why you might yawn when you see someone else yawning, for example. What works for basic actions, such as smiling and crying, also works when it comes to athletic performance and complex learning, too. In other words, mirror neurons are responsible for the learn-by-watching-and-doing effect. 
Video games can be strong trainers for this. This includes changing behaviors through social simulations. So, you can imagine what flying down this virtual track is doing for my brain then. It's still learning by watching and doing, even if I'm not in a real vehicle right now. My mirror neurons would struggle to know the difference with a lot of today's advanced technology. Back to the analogies from the first video of the Simulator is Life series, remember our brains wouldn't be able to tell if they were jacked into some matrix-like simulation? The simulation hypothesis exists today to explain how limited our brains would be fooled, and that's an interesting notion, considering that our echo chambers could be like that matrix that we don't even see. Awareness is perhaps the most elusive skill. And if you're curious about that portion and haven't seen it yet, I'll link it. Since mirror neurons help us interpret the intentions of others, simulated experiences can be created for practice, especially for people in sales or customer service positions. Social simulators for business situational training might throw you this exact curveball to see if you have the self-awareness that they're looking for in a manager position. Never underestimate the personality test being administered for your interview. They don't pay developers and psychologists to create these animated simulators for no reason. They want to know if your social skills are a good investment. Maybe that test is meant to reveal what kind of liability you can be. Are you going to cost them in turnover or discrimination lawsuits because you lack self-awareness? Like the simulators police officers use for training. They can tell how fast you pull a trigger on someone and if you pull faster on bias. That's a pretty clever way to catch someone on a few ideology problems that they're in denial of having or won't admit. Useful tools simulators can be hardly a toy when applied in that situation and certainly not a game, and not a waste of time if it can save lives. The next time someone tells you that games are a waste of time, perhaps you have gained a new perspective over what benefits games can provide. Is living longer a waste? is preventing profit loss, or any of the other issues that could benefit from simulation experience. A few years ago, I was following around professional racers who were both at the very beginnings of their career, as well as long-retired veterans who attended club race leagues just for the fun of it. It was often very observable which racers had mastered their mirror neurons while the younger racers didn't even understand the value. You don't have to tell the kids to play video games twice. But maybe more evidence would be required for the veterans to find simulators a viable tool for learning. Originally, I was doing media for a brat kid named Kyle Lowe. That's a story for uh, another day to elaborate on how ego and lack of empathy actually affects your ability to perform on a racetrack. But for now, I'll touch on the concept that motor skills are fairly intertwined with how you stabilize your emotionality. There's links to the sources cited down below for these topics, but it's why he frequently kept wrecking out his Formula 4 car during practice or racing. It didn't matter how little or how much pressure he was under from competition, it was his brain taking him out. He managed to do it one day on the track completely by himself at Sonoma during practice, turned around the next racing weekend and wrecked again. Which gets pretty expensive when your dad's footing the bill, but his dad was also the source of the emotional stress that was impossible to remove from the picture. I don't just follow racers to race events, I went to test days, karting weekends, and simulator practices too. Here's what baffled me. The owner of the simulator company doesn't know why simulators are effective. He's selling his training for hundreds of dollars, but can't even explain how it works. Yikes. I think I understand why his business hasn't been that successful. But besides that, it models how little people realize the power a simulator actually has to shape the brain. Even the people promoting their hues overlook that, perhaps. If you ever feel bad about how much you wipe out on a sim practicing in relative perspective, I can assure you that I've seen more crashing by a professional racer than I've seen most Twitch streamers and YouTubers. Just keep driving! Luckily, my experience wasn't all as disappointing as Kyle Lowe, as I would go on to meet other racers with better attitudes and also get to see more driver development program at World Speed Motorsports. Two notable characters among the veteran racers were John Purcell and Jay Horak. Night and day difference between the two, and it really doesn't surprise me that the consistently, about 90% of the time, Purcell would beat Horak. Weekend after weekend, race after race in the same spec cars and you know what you see off the track. 
Purcell calmly walks around, softly speaks, and maintains a humble mindset about his own success. What does Horak do? If he does so happen to win, you'll know because he's gonna hoot and holler about how good he is all the way to the podium. About that lack of self-awareness. You can always find Jay loudly telling stories at the VIP tables. Nothing calm about his displays. While Jay nearly starts fights with racers he blames for his defeat in the pits, his excuse merely proves how much the lack of perspective is stunting his lap times. More time on a simulator wouldn't be the only thing that might improve his skills, a little less bravado might go a long way. You can tell if a team is super serious when they have a psychologist or a neuro researcher on staff. One of the single largest advantages a racer can give themselves is fiercely connected prefrontal cortex that can make decisions faster than lightning can chain from the sky to the ground. Sometimes that obnoxious eye racing chat is exactly what you need to train your emotions. Learn to feel the trash talk, focus back on what your hands and feet are doing, and then let the trash take itself out. Don't discredit the power of emotional training utilizing a simulator. Someday, you might just end up as zen as old man Purcell, who almost never lost. Let your critics make you faster. Eh, sidebar here. Check out World Speed Driver Development Program if you're in need of a real-life race sports team for Formula Racing. It's composed of people with prior experience in professional leagues from IndyCar to IMSA. Located in Sonoma, California, it's Sonoma Raceway with 25 years in the race support business. And no, this is not a paid endorsement. I just really think they do stellar work from the president to the techs and even the truck driver transport too. They're all lovely people. But back to simulators. If they're a toy, then this toy has unimaginable power over our mirror neurons, which has incredible consequences for the good or the bad. Whatever we practice or watch, we can become better at it, even if it's not the best thing for us. And that applies whether simulator or reality. So it's worth considering what we spend our hours doing and how it's strengthening neural connections in our brain. As developers make ever more advanced virtual worlds to play in, the brain can be more immersed in learning experience provided. This is excited when thinking about racing sims, but maybe more of an ethical debate when it comes to platforms such as the metaverse with algorithms. And it's just no longer a conceptual idea, but a new corporate reality. As we enter into the next level of tech, we can look back at the experience we already have to understand why there can be risks as well as rewards with the usage of any innovation. We've come to expect reward from our social media feeds and only further impair our neurochemical system when it provides nothing significant, but it is designed to keep us coming back. Many of us underestimated that, and it seems that we may still not have learned how much we are playing with fire, about to get burned by our own lack of awareness. We can be more informed about what tech is doing to our brain. Look at simulators and games at large. They're an incredible example. Lawmakers love to go back and forth on the game's role of violence in society. Science studies also go back and forth on if they're having negative effects or positive. When looking more closely at the studies themselves, an interesting pattern starts to emerge. The games can have damaging or beneficial impacts based on how they're designed by studios or utilized by its players. In this, games are certainly not created equal and deserve some critical thought over what it can do to the brain, especially after hours and hours of shaping. And here's Jane again, because she's got an interesting example from first-person shooter format type games that look at how this effect might be different with different outcomes. Even the shoot 'em ups like Call of Duty or something? So I don't personally play games where I have to try to kill creatures. That's just not my thing. But for people who are drawn to those games, there is uh, quite a lot of evidence that when you play them with people you know in real life, whether you're on a team or you're playing online with friends, there are so many benefits in Mm -hmm. terms of the strength of your relationship, your ability to process a lot of information quickly and make better decisions under pressure faster. So there's cognitive benefits, there's social benefits. We don't see those benefits in the first-person shooter world when you are mostly playing against people you don't know. And that's because there is one negative effect associated with it, which for shorthand you might call it testosterone poisoning, um, (laughs) which 
Which means that you're, when your opponent in a game is somebody who you don't know who they are, you kind of anonymize them. And this is the same thing that leads to flame wars on the internet and a lot of you know, vicious trolling. When you don't know the other person, you're not going to have any social consequences for being a poor sport when you win. It creates a set of emotions um, that kind of jack up your testosterone, make you more unpleasant to be around for hours afterwards, less kind people that you perceive as weaker than yourself. You're more likely to be insulting or aggressive. And this continues after you've been playing. Hmm. Um, So I always say, if you love these games, you need to spend at least half of your time or more playing with people you know. I think it's worth looking deeper into games and what the time you spend with them can work against you or work with your self-improvement journey. Just don't let anyone tell you that nonsense that they're always a waste of time. If that were the case, no company would be investing in them and the pilots flying your plane wouldn't be sitting in one for hours before they're allowed to touch the controls of an actual aircraft. Games aren't just some waste of time. They can potentially add years to your life, promote emotional resilience, build social strengths, and even train amazing physical skills. It's all about the hours and neuron connections. How might you adapt your game skills to your everyday life? How much more can you stretch, not just the skills, but also your brain with the time that you enjoy? Just a toy? (laughs) What do you think? Thanks for sticking around, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, all, and bye-bye!